airframe, how clean that was. Those, they, they used a heavier metal than the original Schweizer glider had on it, and they're stretched. I mean, it's just stretched as smooth as can be. What they did is, before these planes would go on a mission at night, uh, the crew chief would be on the ground, they fly about 200 feet over the maintenance shack, two or 300 feet, and when that propeller got about as big as my hand, you'd hear a light flutter. And then, when the airplane came over, you'd hear just this rush over the wing, and when the, when the, uh, when the tail was about like this, that was all you heard. And that's pretty low. And we were listening, you see how quiet it is, we were listening for whistles and rattles. And one of the amazing things we did to solve that problem is we used duct tape. And uh, we would, there were certain places on the airplane where the cowling, you know, like this. So we, we, we pretty much knew where to put the duct tape on. So we usually just sent them, sent them out with some duct tape on the airplane. And sometimes you can see them in some of the pictures. Um, again, this is, uh, uh, this is, oh yeah, here's 001, the one upstairs right here. These are very rare photos. One of the, one of the problems, again, is we weren't supposed to be taking these photos. And then the photos that were taken of the airplane were done by Lockheed Missiles and Space People. So we had to get a lot of these photos from them. And the, um, Doug Smith, Doug Smith was over there. He took a lot of these photos in Vietnam. A sad thing had happened when Lockheed merged with Martin. Martin threw out all the video of these airplanes, all, all kinds of drawings. But uh, we, we have the engineering drawings, all the manuals and stuff like that on it. But we're missing all that 16, would it be 16 millimeter? Probably 16 millimeter uh, film. And you know, test stuff with the tuppets on there. Uh, Maybe it's so, on eBay. What? Maybe it's on eBay. No, what it is, they took it mm -hmm. to, and went to, this was back in, mm, boy, I don't know, whenever Martin merged with Lockheed, that was quite a while ago, and they took it and they just dumped it in a dumpster. The secretary uh, found our website, and this was a couple of years after this had happened, and she told me, called me up and told me what was, what was ha what had happened, because I've been looking for this stuff anyway, and uh, I kind of wish she hadn't told me, because it like it just about broke my heart. I was just going, oh, no, no. But she says they did manage to save about 20% of it, so somewhere in the Lockheed uh, Martin file someplace, they've got, got these. Here's another one, nice picture of the airplane. You can really see that, that, uh, that wingspan. That's the thing. Uh, okay. Uh, Chuck Hinton was our Lockheed rep over there, and he worked with us uh, guys that he knew, I think he knew about everything on the airplane, some condition equipment. But uh, I tell you what, if it wasn't well, at first, uh, there was a couple of Lockheed guys over there. I don't know if this program would have gone well because of the, the Army was supposed to have sent over a whole bunch of trained guys. Instead, they sent over guys like me that just got out of school. So everybody's supposed to have one year experience since Thing like that, but we're all we're smart, fast learners, and the whole thing. You can see this is up at Fubai by the DMZ, and you can see the 130 flying over the, the back, the six bladed prop on it. And okay, and I just want you to oops, here we go. Just want you, uh, I put these numbers up here 11, that's uh, how many YO3As that were built. Nine, and you can talk to me about this later. Nine is the number that went to Vietnam. And uh, 14 are the number of months that we flew over in Vietnam with these airplanes, and they never, they never were shot down, never took around. Uh, they made pretty amazing. So, uh, 007, the one I was crew chief on, when it came back from Vietnam, had 760 hours on it for that 14 months, which is pretty. That's pretty good, isn't it? And most of those hours, most of those hours were accrued not with the six-blade prop, but when they put the three-blade prop down. Yeah. So anyway, just. Got a little bit of information there. How many hours? About 760. Uh -huh. I've got the logbook on the airplane. It was came with it. You said it was 007. Yeah. <laughs> we we uh, actually the plane upstairs. My friend Fred Garrett was crew chief on it. He named his air airplane Happy. He was the youngest guy in our group. And of course, mine was the Bond plane. You know, <laughs> we we couldn't write anything on the airplane. Uh, they wouldn't let us put stuff on there. This is uh, this is uh, number 10. Um, and it's a NASA airplane, and we have a gentleman here that was involved in converting this YO3A to a flying microphone platform. And uh, the microphones are on the tip of the wing, the top of the tail, and what they would do is a helicopter would fly behind the YO3A, and my understanding is they 
had some X marks on the thing there where they got that thing just set up just right. They'd make a recording and they'd send the, the DB information to the engineers. And the reason that they had this up in the air is because, and I'm not an engineer, but I have somebody here you might want to talk to afterwards if you're interested in it. But it's, it has to do with sound bouncing and up and down. This airplane was also used, and you might know this, with the, uh, the sonic boom testing with the SR-71 Blackbird. And uh, that, uh, according to Mary Harness, uh, there at NASA, she said that this airplane saved that program. And they got a tremendous amount of information out of it. The idea is they want to take the, the, uh, the boom out of the sonic. And apparently, or theoretically, it's possible to do. And uh, the information that came off this thing just gave them a quantum leap in that direction. Again, uh, my friend Randy Hobbs there at the, uh, up here took a picture of the airplane. They had it up here when they're putting a new engine in. The airplane still flies. It, uh, they've got to come up. It's down at, uh, uh, let's see, it's down there at, uh, oh, no, what's up? Edwards, yeah, Edwards Air Force Base down there right now and it's waiting for a $5,000 uh, periodic maintenance on the thing. I'm trying to get it out into the public and uh, someplace so they can fly it so they can actually hear the airplane, or not hear it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, after Vietnam, this is really interesting. Two of these airplanes were, became property of the uh, FBI. It was used in the Patty Hearst case, wounded knee, kidnapping and extort extortion, they went all, all kinds of cases. They were all over the country, United States. And uh, the F, when the FBI agents, in fact, two of them were members of our group uh, that were involved with the flying of, of these airplanes. And just a quick story for the FBI guy, he, he told us, um, um, uh, Vance Duffy, he said that the, the airplane was so new at that time that the, the, it, it, was like a, it was like a piece of science fiction. The agents on the ground, uh, they had trouble believing he was seeing what he was seeing. And he said in one situation, there were three agents on one side of a building, and the bad guy was on the other side of the building, and he was moving a certain direction. So Vance tells him, okay, this is, this is what the guy's doing. Well, the agents are looking up, and they can't, they're going, nah, nah, like this. And one of them was looking up, and he was picking his nose. And Vance, Vance <laughs> identified the guy and identified that he was picking his nose. <laughs> and so, and so, that kind of yeah, he stopped him. Another time, yeah, just another quick story that I like that he told me that he flew that airplane. He said he flew the airplane about on the over the runway where the agents were sitting before before he was going to land. He threw the airplane, flew the airplane about mm, 300 feet overhead, you know, see what would happen. They didn't even look up. So anyway, he said, well, I'm going to come down a little lower. So he, he flew over, he says about 150 feet. 150 feet is really low. And these guys are talking. He went over 150 feet. And they, he said, after he left, somebody kind of went like this, you know. You can see, like, he came back around. This time, he put the wing about 10 feet, 15 feet away from him, right off the runway. And he came up, and they didn't hear him come until he was right there. And then uh, they, uh, they, hit, they hit the deck. And he was like this, but uh, but that was true. But Vietnam, we had to be very careful because you you turn around that in that airplane because your ears are like you know this is where you're going to get all your stuff. And the airplane come taxing in and like this, and you, you we we were always concerned about that and had to take safety precautions in that in that direction. Um, so anyway, we got that, and then okay, I want to tell you where the airplanes are right now. Um, We've got number one uh, is uh, right up here, and uh, it's yellow. And number two, let me see what number two is. What is number two? Okay, number two. This is the well, the first one that crashed over in Vietnam. They had a fuel fuel problem. They had put plastic fuel lines in the airplane. This is a missile company now building this airplane, and the only <laughs> airplane they ever built. Somebody says uh, this should be the last. Hope it's the last they ever built. <laughs> uh, but. They, they had plastic fuel on They were trying to keep the weight down. And it got a fuel lock in the thing. At night, the pilot went off the runway and he had to set it down on the road. And it skidded tore, and tore, basically tore the mission equipment off, busted up the wing. The two of them got out okay and uh, were rescued. Number three is up in a, um, it's up, it belongs to a pilot, one of our warrant officers in Vietnam, and he wanted to 
He got the airplane after Vietnam. He wanted to be a private detective. And so he, he started working on that thing and he ran out of money. So he put the thing in, in storage up there. He lives in Florida now. Number four. Number four, and this is a sad, sad thing. This was about a year, a year and a month into the to our program over in Vietnam, and a uh, pilot observer came back, and I don't know, if, we don't know if they got disoriented or what, but uh, they went 45 degrees into the ground, and uh, there was some speculation that there might have been have been uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and uh, uh, the, the the official report it was fuel starvation. But uh, it was interesting that in a month after we left Vietnam, um, they came up with the organization, third organizational maintenance manual on the airplane. And it's got all this uh, testing for carbon monoxide in it. So we don't, we don't know. We don't know if it was what, what thing. But it was very sad. Number uh, five, that's uh, up in Seattle now. And we just finished restoring that at the uh, Payne Field uh, restoration place up there. And if you're up in that area, go take a look at it. It's going to, they're moving it into the main part of the museum. It's going to be with their SR-71 Blackbird. It's going to be the noisiest and the quietest, loudest, fastest, and slowest airplane right together. So that would be kind of interesting. Number, uh, let's see, where are we at? That was number five, number six. Uh, two years ago, three years ago, I worked with them to get that uh, restored. It's in their museum, their new, their new main part of their museum. If you go in there, it's hanging over their SR-71 Blackbird. We've got that one, but seven, uh, number seven. Um, unfortunately, that was the one I was crew chief on. We tried to restore it with a third pursuit squadron down in Cable, California. And sadly, uh, the museum had a disagreement with a third pursuit squadron. And after all this work we put into it, they uh, basically took it back. And it's if you go on the internet, it's for sale. They want $98,000 for it. And if anybody wants to buy it, I come with the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> the Bond airplane. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a Bond airplane, you know. I got a, you know, you, a whole year with an airplane, you get affectionate toward it, you know. Uh, and number eight, uh, number eight, this was a, um, in Vietnam, this was a weather, they didn't have a weather prediction they had here. They came back from a mission and they were trying to skirt some weather. They ran out of, out of fuel. Uh, they set it down by a river on top of some bamboo. They did some damage to it, but nothing like the damage the, uh, the Chinook did when it picked it up and dropped it. So uh, that was, <laughs> we got out of control. You know, you got these big wings on this thing and uh, the, uh, it, it was really weird. So uh, number, uh, we're up, where are we at now? We're number nine. Number nine is, um, where is number nine? Six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, New Mexico? No, yeah. No, no. Number 10. Let's see. Number, oh, let's see. The zero, there was 10 plane, but they never, you know, zero. But this is in Fort Rucker, Alabama. And now I'm having a brain say Mine is, um, oh, it's it's crashed. Not, that's not a Let me see. Well, let me see. Oh, where is number nine? Huh. Okay, I'll figure it out shortly. Uh, you can go on the website. We have a <laughs> we have a website. Uh, it'll come to you in a minute. But uh, we have a, Doug Doug Smith took a lot of real nice photographs, and his, and his widow gave us uh, the shoe box full of photos he took over in Vietnam, and we've got a bunch of them over here. As you can see them in flying overhead shot, and the pilot in the back. The pilot in the back is Borcher. He's the one that was killed over there. And, uh, so this is a cover of a book. There is no book out on the Wild 3A airplane. And our group has all the stuff we've gathered together. I'm the historian and the last reunion, they they non they voted me to be the guy to write the book on the airplane. But it's going to be a, a collaboration. I've got some good stories in there. Stuff like that should be published this next summer and out. And hopefully have it in museums here. And you'll get uh, you'll see some photos you never never seen before on this. And then um, I do have something, if you got a moment more, I can 